Welcome to a new episode of Talking Out Cloud. I'm Danny, your host. I'm leading in our daily business, the global international strategy for Intercept. Today, we will talk about infrastructure. Related topics are disaster recovery, infrastructure as code, cost management, and a bit about automation with pipeline. Today, I have in my studio Simon Lee and Gert-Jan Poffers, who are both Intercept uh, Azure consultants. Welcome both. Yes, thanks for having us, Danny. Thank you. Likewise. So before we start, we're actually going into the topics. Maybe a brief introduction about you. Sure. Simon. So I'm Simon. I've been with Intercept two and a half years now, I think. Started off as like managed services and then worked my way up to be an Azure consultant, um, getting to work alongside Gert Jan and yeah, helping build and develop uh, our customer environments. Thanks. And Gert Jan? Uh, I'm Gert-Jan Poffers, uh, living in the Netherlands, 30, 38 years old. Um, working as an Azure consultant for Intercept for four months now, I think. Um, working in IT landscape for 20 years now, um, beginning as a manager, engineer, um, working up as an Azure consultant um, in my last job and did it for Intercept for now. Cool. Thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure. <coughs> so let's talk about infrastructure. Yep. And then primarily, let's start with disaster recovery. I was thinking, why is it important? Why is it needed? And what actually does it help an organization? Sure. Okay. So I always think from like a disaster recovery point of view is how important is your business at the end of the day? And if you lose either your customer's data or your environment, can you still function as a business without those critical services? Or what happens if if that data goes goes missing? Um, How quickly can you restore that sort of um, business continuity. And from an Azure point of view, um, there's a couple of different services that that you can use for that. So you've got Azure Site Recovery. So it might be that you're in the migration period and you've got your on-premises data center and that has a power outage and using Azure Site Recovery, you can then fail over your on-premises workload up to Azure. And it might be that once you've done that, that failover that you feel and find that using Azure is fine and you go, well, we don't need to have that on-premise data anymore, and you can run it all in the cloud. Exactly, um, um, and it's nice to to notice that um, um, companies um, um, often um, um, look at disaster recovery uh, as a backup, but it's not a it's not a backup. Disaster disaster recovery is totally different um, um, to, yeah. uh, as a use case. So you must think about um, what if you st- um, to start up your your mm-hmm. environment and you have nothing left. So it's a good thing to to um, um, think about um, solutions to uh, get the, the 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 environment ready in an, an, an another region. Uh, maybe uh, the the West European region is not not available anymore. Please put it in uh, in another region. So uh, a good thing about uh, uh, to think about, definitely. So what's then a common use case for actually disaster recovery? Because you just mentioned like an outage from Microsoft. So obviously yeah. it, it probably can happen. Uh, but at the same time, like what's more maybe common that happen? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it, it could be that you have a data center outage, or it might be that you want your your business and your uptime. So, it, because it's really important that you can then spread it over multiple regions. So then you're covering so that if there is a region outage or a data center outage, say in West Europe, you can then automatically fail over. So your end users or your customers wouldn't see any downtime, or there might be a little bit of downtime, but it wouldn't be hugely noticeable. So you've then got that like five times uptime and availability. Yeah, you always need to uh, look at the uh, at the uh, at the doom scenario. I think because um, Azure resources ha- as a natural uh, way of um, as some Azure resources have a natural uh, way of uh, re- recovering uh, services in, in other regions, but um, there's always uh, a point that um, that there's nothing nothing left. But maybe it's a, da- a, 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 a zone of failure or something like that, and you need to, uh, and you want to deploy it in uh, now let's say in North Euro- Europe. Then um, you need to think about what is the Azure resource um, um, I want to build up first in that region, and there are tools for uh, um, uh, to to do that easy way. Eh? You have uh, uh, what Simon says and 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 a natural um, Azure site recovery, um, synchronization, live synchronization to other other regions, eh? to to uh, replicate the disk uh, to to another region. But there are all um, uh, other things that you can do to um, um, to make it possible. <coughs> Should says. Do you have, have you ever do have you have so, some examples, uh, Simon? I've used Azure Site Recovery um, 
not an inset, but as a previous role where we initially used it for doing a migration thing because they wanted to trial it out. And you can basically pre-stage some of it, which was really cool. Um, but I think another thing to point on, out on is that it's not just about like the Azure solutions. It's also having a strategic plan from a disaster recovery point from going, we have a disaster. How long is it going to take to recover from this? And what is the impact on the mm. business? Yeah. So as well as using all the Azure services, which are great to, to be able to get the data back up, it's also going, well, what is the impact on the business? How long is it going to take us to restore? And then potentially, what is the financial cost of this? If you're down for maybe a couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks, which is why, like Gert Yam was saying, being able to fail over to different regions can cut down some of that restore time because you can just go, well, we'll fail over to North Europe, to UK South, to UK West, yeah. um, and just bring those services back up. Whereas like from before, from the, you know, the older days when it was all done on premises, you would have to sit there with all your backup tapes, yeah, yeah, sure. put them all back in, and it could be a week's worth or a weekend's worth of restoring to get those services back up. Yeah, exactly. Would it also include an in architectural um, design? Yeah. As in probably my yeah. data from one end goes to, for example, Western Europe, but then other data or other maybe services go to Northern Europe, et cetera? Yep. So when we're doing designs and stuff, if, if the customer is asked for backup, what we would recommend is you can go through and we'd normally say, well, we'll create a new tenant so it's isolated and then we'll offload that data to a totally separate tenant, to separate subscription with different like access rights. So it's if there is a problem, whether that's data loss or ransomware encryption, we've got another set in an isolated environment. Yeah, exactly. And you also need to, to, to look at the, the capacity in the other region as well. So you need, you need to uh, design an architecture uh, uh, plan for the other region N not without uh, the network flows and all, all that sort of stuff, but also um, if there's an outage in a region, let's say for West Europe, you're not probably not the only one with it with, with the outage. So you also need to uh, reserve capacity in the other region, also to uh, put your compute and that sort of stuff yeah. in in, in uh, um, back as well. So um, yeah, that's it, that, that's also a good point to think about um, when uh, when when uh, thinking about disaster recovery. Yeah. And I assume some of the services, like probably SQL or something, do have geo redundancy in builds, probably. Yeah. Um, so how do you like manage the difference then between that kind of services available versus uh, the disaster recovery? So it kind of depends on how you've deployed them. And SQL's a really interesting one because you can deploy it in like three or four different versions in Azure, for example. So it could be that you've deployed it in, inside of a virtual machine. Um, it might be because you need it's for a specific use case, and then you can put that virtual machine either within like an availability set and then have it replicate around. But if you use like Azure SQL, it's natively redundant and it's got automated backups for you, which yeah. is really nice from like a sysadmin point. You don't have to think about anything. You just go, I've got my data, it's there, and Microsoft manage all the back end for you. Um, and then, yeah, you can move it around and it's all HA. <laughs> yep. Got it, got it. <clears throat> so what kind of best practices more can you share about specifically disaster recovery? Make sure that you have a disaster recovery plan and you know what um, the time to restore is and also test your backups. Yeah, do a month, do a, do a, or, or even do a quarterly or monthly yeah. uh, disaster recovery test. Uh, isolate your, um, 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 because you have different scenarios you can do for disaster recovery. You can do an active-active uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. You can do an active-passive scenario. So um, um, mainly it's it, it, um, have some resources in another region already that you all um, that you can uh, deploy uh, some compute uh, to another region to test uh, uh, if the disaster recovery is working here correctly, um, or um, um, if you have uh, if you have don't have any infrastructure already in another region, um, um, yeah, do it with uh, with code or do it with uh, with, an, with an active deploy, but it's. You can think about you must think about it before the disaster recovery, uh, and also uh, good to mention is uh, with all plans um, um, you have in mind, uh, it's all go good to um, uh, notice that it um, can cost a little bit more when you have already deployed some resources in another region. So um, um, it's it's also a matter uh, what the customer uh, wants to um, um, yeah. Uh, wants to buy uh, for the disaster. What's the disaster recovery worth? That, that's mainly the, the the best part to to, to notice. Um, um, 
it's it's like an insurance you you you, you make and the and, and insurance is um, yeah can cost uh, but it uh, can um, be beneficial in, uh, in for future purposes. Yeah, it's one of those things that sometimes I'll say to customers, Mike, you can't really put a price on disaster recovery or backups mm. because it is your business, and if you did have a failure, you know, from a financial point, could that end your business? And is that something that you really want to gamble with, or just go? will just pay for it, knowing that then you can sleep soundly at night, that all your data is there, um, so you can get out get out of a problem if there is one. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, from like a, a use case scenario, talking about like disaster recovery plans, I had um, an issue at a previous company where we had backups for a virtual machine that they hadn't done the quarterly DR testing on, so the backup said it was fine, and then we had a problem with the server and we had to do the restore, and it just wouldn't restore. No. <laughs> so we then had to spend a whole week yeah. rebuilding this whole machine from scratch. Exactly. And I was like, this is why you're supposed to go through and do those quarterly tests to make sure. You and then to. if it doesn't work, get a set of engineering guys to go through and go, right, okay, why? Why is this not working? Let's go go and fix it. Yeah, you need to know your IP flows and that sort of stuff. Yeah. If, uh, because if, if it's hard-coded in the, in the VM itself, you need to uh, or already deploy it in the, in the other region. So best practice is mainly... Uh, Make an architecture um, a plan, um, uh, do a cost analysis, uh, and, and probably the most important question is: ask the customer what what, what is what is the important data for for the customer, um, and include it in the plan, um, yeah, and test it, yeah. test the disaster recovery. Definitely. And how do you select your region? Because you also mentioned uh, availability of resources. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, I know there are some uh, differences in prices for some of the regions. So what else is interesting for customers to decide, okay, here's why, well, here's why I put my disaster recovery? Good question. Yeah. I think part of it comes down to like a GDPR point as well. Because, mm -hmm. yes, there are lots of like regions that you can use in Azure, but it's also going, well, how does this work from like a data protection point? Do we want our like customer data stored here? And it might also be from like a latency point. For example, if you're only working with like Dutch customers, you wouldn't want to go put that data over in the US because the latency would obviously be longer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely factors to sort of take into that from from yeah a DR point and recovery. You have also uh, natural paired regions as well. So if you uh, pick West Europe, you you have a natural paired region with North, North Europe as well. So um, there are a little combinations you can you can do um, 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 if you. So that's also in the in the in the plan you need you need to think about before the disaster recovery is. But um, if one region fails and I um, and I fail over to another region, where is the next step? I, I will bring my 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 computing data to. So um, um, yeah, also something to discuss with the customer. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Are there currently any trends around disaster recovery? You can name of. Um, no, I, I think that 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 uh, no uh, trends, um, um, but yeah, there are, there are a few, few trends. Uh, Simon named named uh, one, one of uh, one of those uh, um, the, the the way you you can disaster recovery, but probably um, um, the, the 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 important ones uh, to name is um, the way how you do the disaster recovery. So I, I mentioned them early: uh, active, active, passive, active, yeah. active, passive. Do you want to? Uh, uh, and that's mainly uh, included with the RPO and RTO uh, time, uh, the recovery uh, time of the of the of the resource. So, um, in my opinion, uh, if you use Azure, uh, um, um, use Azure, Azure Backup and Azure Native resources to to uh, to do the disaster recovery, um, and yeah, that's that's the the main thing I think. Um, yeah. 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 Got it. So let's talk about a bit about infrastructure as code. Yeah. Um, I think this ties in nicely to disaster recovery as well. Exactly. Because you've had your disaster and you now need to rebuild your environment. And if you've done it through a ClickOps way and through the portal, it can be quicker, but you can't replicate that. And if you've run out of backups or your backups don't work, as we've just discussed, having infrastructure as code from like a very high level means that you can rebuild that environment super quickly, it's going to be the exact same, and you can stand up more resources in a smaller amount of time than doing it through the portal if you've got to rebuild, say, 20 or 30 servers and deploy all the software. That's going to take ages, whereas using infrastructure as code, 
it's like one line potentially of a deployment or you can do it through a pipeline, which I know we're going to touch on later. Um, and it stands up the whole environment, which is really cool. And that's probably also uh, um, to get back on the on the first uh, sub, uh, uh, you asked for the trend. That that's mainly uh, maybe the trend to do that. Uh, yeah. That's that's the way to do that. So so um, you can do it f through portal, but the 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 the, the, tr the trend we see is is mainly do it with with ERP with infrastructure as code, because you have all, all set all the code in place to to fill over to other regions. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a lot of positives for using infrastructure as code, um, partly. It can be version controlled, which is a really important thing. So if you're doing like, say, software releases of, of something, if you store it all within GitHub or Azure DevOps or whatever you're using for your source control, it means that it's a version controlled. You can have four eyes principle before it gets pushed to production. So there's no mistakes made. You can then automate some of the processing for that, um, which is really cool. And it's what we've been working on recently um, for a couple of our customers um, where we're just building it all in infrastructure as code. And it's really cool. Like the files are huge; they're like twenty thousand lines, but it builds a whole environment pretty much instantaneously, right? And it's reusable. Yeah, you can you can reuse it for for multiple projects as well. Yeah. So that's the cool thing about it. Yeah. So for for the use case that I've got at the moment, we've got like an acceptance, a test, and a production environment, mm -hmm. and literally it's the same code. All we do is we just change the parameter being the environment type to either be acceptance, test, or production, and it just changes the prefix and deploys the exact same environment and then the customer can test it and they go, yep, we're happy with this. We'll move on to the next phase and then move on to the next phase. Yeah. Which is really, really cool stuff. Yep. And what kind of tools or templates forms are you using for this one? So because we primarily use Azure at the moment, we're using Bicep, which is like, it's a Microsoft Azure native platform. Um, but there are, as, as you know, being a podcast, there are other options available <laughs> yeah. for other cloud service providers that we won't mention, but some of them are. Um, so there's Terraform, which is used quite widely. And then um, there's now an open source version of it called Open Tofu, um, which I, I've not really looked at. In the, like, I, I know it's there, but I haven't really tried it. Um, so yeah, for, for the most part, we've just done stuff in like Bicep. Bicep. Um, and that's kind of what we're standardizing on at the moment, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, if you went down the Terraform route, you can then use it across like AWS and GCP. Yeah, um, which is really cool. Yeah, but and Bicep is also cool because um, it, 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 it's being uh, developed uh, over uh, I think two, two years ago or uh, something yeah, like that. Something like that. Um, first, you need to create all the all the modules uh, by yourself, and uh, use uh, and and now they 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 have uh, of Microsoft they they come up with the, the Azure Verified modules, also uh, AVM modules. There's basically modules Microsoft and the community has built uh, um, to um, yeah to ease the the the, the, the workload. Yeah. Um, and we can use that those mod modules to uh, do exactly the same without the hard, hard coding we did in the in, in the in the past. Um, and it's all supported by Microsoft. So and, and the community. So if there are, if there are problems or you you can ask Microsoft to to help assist us. So um, yeah, it's very. And it's reusable, and that's that's the most important thing. You can you can reuse it for for multiple projects, multiple su subjects. You can pick uh, uh, little things out. You can pick, uh, yeah, do a lot a lot of stuff with it. Yeah, Very and, nice. the, and the nice thing with the new bicep modules that are coming out. So originally you'd have to download like a five hundred meg file, <coughs> which had like all the stuff in, the, in mm -hmm. that you needed. And with the new ones, it's all like online and internet based. So it mean, that means the file sizes of your repositories in your infrastructure's code is one file with like the parameter files and the other bits and pieces you need to call, but it, it's going to be so much quicker. So much quicker, yeah. Which is really nice. Yeah. And uh, what, what kind of platforms do you visit to actually find those repositories or So files? for the new Bicep modules, it, they're Example. called the, the Azure Verified modules. Um, and yeah, if you just stick that into a search engine, it'll come up and then it, or if you're using like Visual Studio Code and you've got the Bicep extension installed, when you're creating the modules, it'll give you like a drop down when you're referencing it and it'll give you some options of how you want to call it. Yeah. Um, options, explanation as well. Yeah. It's linked with GitHub, so, so there's, a, there's a lot of uh, readme, uh, uh, readme files to, to see how, and also examples how you can, can fit in uh, your code within, within that uh, it, it, um, yeah, particular situation. So um, lots of documentation uh, to do to uh, to to use that uh, the tool. It's a very nice tool. Yeah. 
So out of curiosity, <coughs> do you guys also use Copilot for this? <coughs> yes. yes. I use GitHub Copilot every day. Um, it's good when it works. <laughs> I think it, it's like the, the whole era that we're in at the moment with like OpenAI and ChatGPT. It's getting better. And I know they've just released the new like 4.0 version. Um, so prior to this, I've been writing PowerShell for probably 10 years, maybe on and off. And it was all self-taught. But using like Copilot inside of VS Code is really cool because you can ask it to do stuff. And I'll have an idea of how I want to write something. And I'll just ask Copilot. And yeah. sometimes it gets it right and yeah. gives you like all the code. And sometimes it doesn't, but it gives you enough of like a framework to go, okay, I can fix the rest of this. Yeah. But it, it it's done the most part. Um, you, you 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 must you, you you must put it in the right direction. So if you yeah. um if you sh if you say something like um, uh, write me uh, um, uh, a story, uh, it it comes with a, a whole story and, and not maybe not the specific specific story you you want to write. So you must be very uh, um, specific. Yeah. Also with code. So I use it also uh, a lot. Uh, Copilot. Um, but for a, for a learning curve, it's, it's easy to write the code yep. first and then use Copilot yep. and, not, and not use Copilot. And then because the learning curve, you you still need to 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 um, sit in the steering wheel. Yeah, and it, it's the same. So we had some new engineers join Intercept and they're like, oh, we're going to go use like ChatGPT and Copilot. I was like, I'd rather you not like, yes, it's very cool at what it does, but you won't understand necessarily what it's giving you back. So like, we'll use it, but because we've been yeah. writing code for so long, I can tell when it's wrong. And the other problem is with like the earlier versions is it would create commands and reference stuff that just didn't exist anywhere. And because I've written PowerShell long enough, I knew that it was rubbish. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think mm, it's definitely a useful aid to have and it saves us lots of time for like when we're writing stuff for customers as well. It helped me a lot with PowerShell, uh, and, and I'm not a PowerShell uh, uh, guy. Um, so it, I use Copilot for uh, for, Copilot for for writing PowerShell, but but uh, I let Simon uh, check my code, and he says all all the faults. So, so uh, I, I'm the exam example in the in this. Uh <laughs> no, it's uh, it's uh, it's Copilot is, is very good, but um, yeah, it's a Copilot. Yeah. So what what other use cases or interesting use cases can you apply for IOC? I think, yeah, for, for the most part, if, if you want to create like the same sort of environment as, as we've kind of already touched on in terms of like having acceptance, dev, production. Um, Makes sense, yeah. And from like a disaster recovery point, if you have that disaster, you can get up, back up and running quicker because it might be that you then move to a different cloud and you've got it, if it's written in Terraform, for example, and you can just deploy it, make a couple of changes, and then you can stand up your environment again. Yeah. Yeah, mainly to to push it from uh, test to, uh, to acceptance to to de to dev environments. Yeah. So only uh, one thing is good to mention is that you uh, if you use if you use that you always need to use that and don't use the portal. So uh, yeah. you you use or uh, EAC or uh, with, with continu continuous deployment or you use uh, the portal. And if you are using uh, uh, um, the portal. And EAC, you always uh, um, need to, uh, yeah, be very careful, careful what what what, uh, what you what you click because the environment will not be the same uh, after um, uh, with with um, uh, as code um, uh, that you have lying on the shelf eh, to the to do the continuous yeah. deployment um, after you click some uh, some settings extra. So that's good to mention. Yeah, no, it's a really good point, and it, it's funny. I was having a conversation with someone about this yesterday. And we were basically saying that in like an ideal world, you would use infrastructure as code, pick a platform. It doesn't matter whether it's Bicep or Terraform or whatever. You then do it through a pipeline. So it requires a 4 hours principle to do the code review. It then deploys it to Azure. And then from like a, a user point, as you were just saying, Gert, Jan, mm. from, from the portal, you only have read-only access. So you can't go through and make those changes. And if any changes do need to be made, they have to be done through infrastructure as code, create the pull request, it then gets reviewed with four eyes and then gets pushed into the environment. Yep. So from a disaster recovery point, you would then have that same code base um, and then maybe have like either a break glass account or a privileged admin account if there's like a P1 and there is a problem where you need to go through and fix some stuff in the portal, um, which I thought was a really interesting way of, of looking at it because I know we do some pipeline stuff, but I know that 
from an engineering point, we do a lot of when we're fixing stuff. It's a lot of portal things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that, that's okay, but but be, be, because uh, f- as a trouble uh, as a, as a point of view uh, for troubleshooting, that, that that's that's um, okay to do that. But and you can do that, but then you need to add it in the code as well. So mm-hmm. uh, and that's may uh, that that's mostly uh, being forgotten with 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 with, uh, with engineers. Uh, they they fix the problem and they uh, continue with the, with the work, with the work, with the daily work progress and um, and. And that's why you said you said it already, Simon. That's why in an ideal in in a toekomst of uh, future purposes, uh, you will need to uh, uh, to have read roll on the portal and do it all with with EAC to have some security to to see some uh, branch control, uh, nah, etc. Yeah, yeah. And I guess there is also some use cases for larger enterprises or corporates that which have multiple environments as well. Yep. Maybe for uh, software different companies who have uh, multiple customers, but then uh, divided through different environments. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have such use cases as well, Intercept? I don't think so. I've got any at the moment. How about you? No, uh, not 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 that But I, I know what you what you mean because. Yeah. Uh, with with large companies, you have all divisions uh, that working on a little bit yeah. pa- little part of of their um, environment. And if if all those people have have the have the right uh, of the all, all the rights in the portal, they they click and they click, and there's no control or whatsoever. So that's only also um, the 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 one uh, purpose for using uh, uh, continuous of IAC or uh, is to give. Control over the pipeline. You you can add the the compute, or you can add the mm. software, or you can add this. Uh, my colleague uh, will review it, and that that that's that's the in, that's the ideal uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so and then of course my my knowledge is limited, but I so the question is then IAC does it also include security and governance? Because I think you slightly touched upon it. It can do. Um, so you've got a really good use case for this at the moment. Um, so we're currently rebuilding our internal managed services onboarding pipeline. Um, and it's all being written in infrastructure as code, and we're trying to do as much of it as possible between like PowerShell and Bicep. Um, and we've got all the Azure policies, whether that's like for compliance bits and pieces, that's all written now in infrastructure as code. So when we have our new customer coming into managed services, they'll get a, a subset of policies that are deployed, and some of that's for governance, for compute, for some security stuff. Yeah make sure that only so many users have got access to x y and z um so yeah like infrastructure code is super powerful it can do some security stuff it can do infrastructure stuff um yes it's a it's a it's a two-way a two-lane um way i think because you you um uh, do it on the front end eh? so so with iac and also with the, at the back end with policies you set eh? if you want to uh, have some security controls or government or uh, you can do it with Azure policy as well um, 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 so, um, um, for example, if you have a, 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 a colleague that wanted to deploy an, a, a computer resource in an, in an environment, and he is control with with he cannot he cannot deploy a, a, a quantum processor, a, a very expensive uh, a machine. Mm-hmm. So um, that's an example you don't want. So you can do it in a code. So so you can say, for, okay. Uh, only allowed are the B series or are the D series, but uh, if you forgot, you can also do a compliance policy in in in, uh, in Azure as well. Do it in IAC or whatsoever to say, okay, you are only allowed for, to to put this uh, machines in the, in the, in the Azure environment. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which really nicely brings us on to the next topic. Yeah, which is cost management. Cost ah. management. <laughs> that's, that's a really go good, for it. Yeah. So, as you were just saying, Gert Jan. From a policy point, you can prevent deploying large N-series virtual machines in Azure, which cost a lot of money, which you don't want to do. So there's there's a couple of ways that you can do the policy. You can either have it to only allow a subset of virtual machines, or you can do it the other way and say that we're going to just deny the really big expensive ones that will cost you a lot of money, um, which is really useful. And yeah, it'll then save you a lot of money. But I think, yeah, should, should we start from the top and go from Azure Advisor yeah. and then run down? Yeah. So the best place to start when you're wanting to try and save some money um, is looking at Azure Advisor, which is a, it's a really cool offering from Microsoft, which goes through the environment and tells you where you can save money on a whole raft of resources, whether that's like virtual machines, SQL Server, 
app services. Um, and it basically gives you a breakdown saying that you can either scale up this machine or scale it down. Um, and then if needs be, you can then look at buying reservations um, for them. And I was having a conversation with a customer a couple of weeks ago about this. So at the moment, in part of their environment, they're starting and stopping their virtual machines after hours, but they've also bought reservations. And obviously when you buy a reservation, you're basically making a commitment yeah. to Microsoft to say, we will use this compute for one year for this SKU size. I was like, so you've already bought that compute time. There's no point stopping the virtual machine because yeah. you're basically losing out on the money that you've paid for. Um, but again, it, it could be, and we were talking about this this morning, mm. weren't we, from like a, an AVD point, which Gert Yan used to do and really likes. <laughs> um, so we, we were basically saying that from an AVD point, you could have like scaling. So on a morning, there might be like one AVD host at like say seven o'clock or yeah. eight o'clock just before the working day starts. And then as the day goes on, it then scales up more yeah. machines yeah. Um, as, as more people join. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, a good, a good that you mentioned that because if you, um, um, there's, in, in, my, in my opinion, there's always um, customers when they are going to make a step to Azure or uh, they are living in Azure and they have high cost, there's always demand for how can we reduce the, the cost um, exactly. And reservation is one thing, but also um, do the right thing. So Because uh, like you said, um, if you stop a machine and you have reservations, you are actually go going to pay extra for that mach machines do. You can all, all calculate that um, before you deploy resources in, in, in Azure. There's a really good uh, pricing calculator uh, on, on, on the internet from Azure itself. Yep. But in the in, in the in practice, you you will see also see that that there's uh, going more data or going more more that you that you have planned for. So um, keep the conversation go conversation going with the customer also also to to, um, to um, make the environment more flexible more um more logical uh, to to reduce the cost so um you have also uh, budgets uh, on the um uh, on the uh, in azure so yeah. you you can you can set up budgets and and born them when you when you are are reaching the budget that's a nice that's that's a nice uh, tool also um but yeah um also, uh, things uh, in, in uh, as you can cost uh, uh, sometimes money, uh, and it's also, but like I said, with the disaster recovery thing, uh, customer needs to um, 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 is what the customer wants. When the customer needs security, you all, you also um, it comes with a little bit of cost. So uh, this is also uh, to keep in, uh, in in mind. Yeah, for that. You got any best practices around uh, budgeting? Because, for example, where should a customer decide, like, this is the budget I want to spend? Is it like based on a cost price? Is it based on actual consumption a uh, month before? Um, for example, if, if the customer is on-prem and they want to uh, migrate from, uh, from, uh, to, to Azure, uh, for that example, uh, you can, can um, uh, calculate the cost. And you will, ask, uh, you, will say, you will say to the customer, okay, this is, the, this is probably the cost uh, you will have. Um, in my opinion, you uh, will set the reservation in a later time. You will discuss it with, with the customer, so um, they will uh, pay a little bit more in the uh, in front and uh, do a little bit more uh, of less uh, paying in, uh, uh, when they continue the environment. But also, um, it's also good to um, um, uh, difference the the subscriptions. I think because um, production. Um, you don't want to cut on uh, out on, on production. Production service, you you'll need to. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it, you can set a, a budget on a production environment, uh, but uh, if production stops working, uh, the customer is also not happy. So set a budget on, the, on uh, best practice. Set a budget on on a test subscri subscription or a dev subscription, um, or um, better better yet, uh, stop the services in the in the test the uh, subscription when you don't need them. You can do that also with with, with, with pipelines. So that the the the, the, the yeah, but, but we discussed uh, in the earlier stage, um, yeah. But mainly also, yeah, communication with the customer, what what the customer uh, um, will need, uh, and also um, um, yeah, think about uh, um, um, yeah, um, um, for example, uh, step in the shoes of the customer. I, I, I would say, how do you how do you want to, to spend your money on the on the environment and 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 be transparent. So I think the subscription method is, an, is, is a nice thing, Simon, uh, yeah. to, to um, set test dev uh, separately from production, uh, make budgets on, on, on the subscriptions and that, that sort of stuff. 
Makes sense. <coughs> Anything else in cost management specifically? Um, no, I think uh, I'm pretty well covered all that off. Um, yeah, setting budgets is a really important one. Yeah. Um, especially when the customers are trying to track stuff. I think having them on like dev environment is really important because when you're building dev stuff, you, you'll be testing stuff and people forget and they deploy more and more stuff into there. And before you know it, it's costing you more than your production environment because stuff's not being cleared down afterwards and being used. Yeah, you can also scan on, on, on the not used item. So if you set your monitoring straight, you can also uh, look for the resources that are not being uh, used and um, yeah, d delete them. Or, yep. or or ask them if the customer if they need uh, some other other uh, things. But but mainly uh, maintain, uh, yeah, it's, it's about monitoring, uh, budgeting, uh, and communication. I think. Yeah. Got it. And then, so we also talked about reservations. Yep. Uh, we talked about automation of scaling. Yep. So what about um, hybrid use of uh, licensing? Yeah, you can do. Um, hybrid benefits is a yep. really nice thing to use to save some additional money. Um, so you can obviously buy them for Windows Server, you can buy them for SQL, you can buy them from AKS, which I didn't know. I've only found that out recently, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a worthwhile thing to, to, to look into. Yeah, and there are also more uh, more um, uh, things you can do uh, to reduce costs. I, I see I see companies, uh, and, and then <laughs> I'll go going through the AVD stuff. Sorry, <laughs> but I, I see some some companies use uh, AVD with uh, uh, Windows Server 2022. Um, um, and if you use AVD, for example, you can use um, the free multi Windows uh, multi uh, 10 ses sessions of uh, L uh, 11 sessions. Sorry. Um, um, that are free and, and, and they're all in the license for the for the for the for the Microsoft as, as well. So um, there are some benefits uh, you can definitely use uh, if you uh, are, are planning to to uh, to uh, purchase them from Microsoft. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and then of course to our listeners, we also have a workshop around cost management. So if you want to find out more about it, uh, feel free to join. Of course. Then um, I hear you guys say about automation with pipeline and function apps. So I would like to go a bit deeper on that one as well. Yeah, basically automate everything. <laughs> automate. Segment <laughs> over, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It makes your life easier. Yeah, it it, it really does. Um, so we've kind of touched on like a little bit of the pipeline stuff through like the infrastructure's code. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pipelines are great stuff and you can get them to do some really intricate things. So from like an infrastructure's code point, you can have it do like security checks and code checks to make sure that there's no secrets being committed, um, that there's no like software vulnerabilities or if you're doing stuff with containers and like Kubernetes stuff, you can run image vulnerability checks to make sure that there's no vulnerabilities within the images. And then if it is, it can then block the IAC deployment to say, hey, you've got a, a vulnerability, you need to go away and look at this. And that's either patching it or delaying the software release until that, that's that been um, patched. Yeah, and and, uh, and one thing for sure is if if you use pipelines, uh, you can also um, use it in your daily day routine, and and also every bank can run a pipeline. So um, if you have set the code um, uh, and, and the testing process uh, uh, as clear as possible, and uh, you document it, uh, everybody can use pipelines. And, uh, and the funny thing is, it's only uh, to run the pipeline and uh, and all the all the things running in the background, you don't have any knowledge about that for running a pipeline. So that's that's the that's the cool thing about it. Yeah. Any preferred tools from you guys? I'd probably say it's split between Azure DevOps and like GitHub Actions. Um, yeah. There's like benefits to both. Um, they've both got like integration into pretty much any cloud, any platform. Um, so we primarily do. I think it's a it's a split yeah, really, yeah, isn't it, between like balance, DevOps yeah, stuff and yeah. and GitHub. Um, but I I started my like pipeline journey out using GitHub Actions and like it taught me how to write YAML and things and then I've recently started doing stuff in Azure DevOps. Yeah, and if you if you look at the, the, the Microsoft Learn uh, sections uh, on the internet, you also see that they mention GitHub and, and DevOps as well. So if you um, wanted to learn how to create pipelines and that sort of stuff, you, they uh, pick up the examples for GitHub and DevOps. There's a, I think that there are the two main yeah. things to, to go at. And there's there's lots of documentation uh, to 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 see much things to learn yeah. also for us <laughs> every day uh, every day uh, yeah there's 
that that are the two main tools i think yeah cool thanks for sharing <clears throat> so what's uh what's the uh, most common use uh, use case or case study you have around specifically for automation um from when i've discussed this before with people it's anything that you do more than that it's like four or five times you should look at trying to automate mm -hmm. so it could be like from a sales perspective if there's like a a certain process that, that that's being done that was being manual um a good example actually i've got is so p1 escalation stuff um so when i first joined intercept i think it was like done as a manual process and it required a couple of people to go through before it was then like deemed as like a p1 i was like what happens if one person is sick say gert jan's got a cold and isn't working today process kind of doesn't work and i'm like okay so we've now automated it so i think we've built like a it's a logic app that goes through and it checks the monitoring and the monitoring then triggers the the logic app and then it fires a message into teams to go hey this server or this service or whatever has gone down um and it works really well yeah, you can also integrate it with you. You also you can also integrate the the, the pipelines with with plugins with Teams or or something like yeah. that. So you can, it it is very fun. I I've I have examples in the in the past uh, to to deploy a whole uh, AVD environments with 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 pipelines, inc mm. including uh, the 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 uh, with Packer and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, um, and funny thing is that that uh, everybody can run the pipeline. Every can everybody can 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 uh, can make images uh, with the, with those pipelines. So um, it 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 takes some effort to to uh, make it with with infrastructure code, make the pipeline uh, to to make. Some, but but eventually yeah. it will always um, uh, pay out. So yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So do you use any AI infusion for this one for automation? I've not yet. I know that we're trialing it in our managed services stuff mm -hmm. and they've written like a, an AI thing to try and help some of the engineers. Yeah. Um, so they're using it to like scrape the Microsoft docs for like Windows server stuff. So when a customer logs a ticket saying like, hey, this service doesn't work inside of my virtual machine, for example, yeah. it'll go off and it'll check the Microsoft docs and come back and be like, well, it could be this, it could be that to try and give them a little bit of like a head start over it. And from what I've seen initially, it looks really cool. Um, and yeah, it should hopefully yeah help them save some time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. But also, um, there's also um, I think it needs a little bit more attention in the, in a couple of years how to uh, develop um, uh, in the way of how, how, how AI will develop in a couple. Of years. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Got it. Anything else you guys would like to share in this podcast for now? No. No, oh, I've 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 said, yeah. No, no. I, I've I've we we have we have talked all all the all the things that we need to yeah. talk about. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's been fun. I've enjoyed that. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Time flies. <laughs> We've had a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, thanks, Danny. No, yeah. thank you. So thank you so much for explaining a bit about disaster recovery, about automation, about um, AIC, of course, and cost management. Um, it has been a pleasure. I've learned some stuff, so that's always good. <laughs> Although I'm limited in my knowledge, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, thank you, listeners, as well, mm. for um, joining this uh, episode of the podcast. Yep. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Gert Jan, for joining, of You're course. Welcome. This is the last one of the series, uh, but definitely, uh, spoiler alert, we'll probably continue with the uh, with the episodes of the podcast cool. because we like it. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for joining both. Yep. And uh, have a great day. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks.